So I'm going to talk about paediatric major hemorrhages. Do we have a role to play in this? So this is the outline of my talk. I will go through the definition, what the BSH guidelines say. I'll go through some of the literature review, and then I'll describe to you three cases that I've been involved in over the last few years. And then what I think our role is as transfusionists in this scenario. So the definition of major hemorrhage in paediatrics is the rapid blood loss with shock or with no likelihood of control. It can be anticipated or actual blood loss of 80 mils per kilogram in 24 hours, 40 mils per kilogram in three hours, or two to three mils per kilogram per minute. It's most commonly seen in the surgical setting, so in cardiac, craniofacial and scoliosis surgery, but it's also seen in trauma and very rarely isolated. However, two out of the three cases I'm going to describe to you are of the latter group. Children have substantial physiological reserve, and so the signs and symptoms of hypervolemia vary. It can often be late. Total blood volume in a term infant is 90 mils per kilogram. And as children grow older, by the time they get to um, adolescence, this drops down to 70 mils per kilogram. But if there's a number that I need you to remember, it's 80 mils per kilogram. The BSH guidelines advocate the use of transexamic acid as this reduces blood loss. And they also recommend the use of cell sal salvage. So transfusion in the world of paediatrics is, is different from adults because component requirements change with age. And this is clearly defined in the guidelines um, written in 2016 by Dr. Helen New and her colleagues. So in a life-threatening hemorrhage where there's no suitable paediatric component available, the guidance recommends providing the next best adult component until the child is stabilized or until the laboratory receives age appropriate components. In a neonatal emergency, group O, D negative pedipacs are recommended and two pedipacs would provide sufficient volume for a neonatal resuscitation. So when I did a literature review for paediatric major hemorrhage, my, I put this into the Google search engine and PubMed search engine and I came up with nothing. If I put bleeding in children, search engines also re revealed nothing. When I put paediatric trauma, I got some results. Uh, uh, an article in the US um, suggests that over 11,000 children die from um, trauma on a yearly basis. Um, blunt injury accounts for 90% of these trauma. Majority are mild to moderate, but some are multi-system. Danish paper reports that globally 950,000 deaths are seen in the under 18 year olds in high income countries and that traumatic brain injury is a leading cause of hemorrhage. Nearly 40% of all childhood deaths are due to injuries. UK data from Tarn shows that in 2014 1300 deaths occurred majority in the first year of life and then adolescence being the uh, next peak. This article by Bevan et al, published in 2016, caught my attention. They suggest that the uh, TAN data states that 66% of paediatric major hemorrhage, major trauma does not initially present to a children's major trauma center. And this suggests that actually a third of um, trauma patients are presenting to non-trauma -tra centres, i.e. local DGH hospitals. This article by Zoe Roberts, published also in 2017, looked at 10-year a review of TARN data between 2008 and 2017. They defined adolescents as aged between 10 and 24, and they recorded over 40,000 cases of adolescent trauma. Majority were seen in MELT, so two thirds, and aged, they were aged between 16 and 24. 
In this 10 year period, they saw a 2.6 fold increase in the total number of cases reported to Tarn, and road traffic collision was identified as the leading cause. They also found that stabbing as a mechanism of injury increased in the 10 year period. They also state that there's an increased number of um, children being treated in major trauma centres. So in 2008, this was 46 percent. And by 2017, this had increased to 60, just over 63 percent. But this article and, that, and the previous do not mention anything about the incident of paediatric major hemorrhage and the blood components needed. I know we have the National Comparative Audit on major hemorrhages. I think we may have some um, data for paediatric major hemorrhages, but this isn't available just yet. So this next slide looks at TARN data between January 2017 and December 2018. Here, all children attending ED following an injury were categorized. So that's over 4 million children. They were categorized according to the injury severity score. The higher the score, the more severely injured. What this report showed was that the most common presentation was in the under one year olds and that age, uh, as the child aged, so as they hit adolescent, the numbers attending ED increased. They identified in non-accidental injuries that the body region injured most commonly was the head and chest. They also looked at the data due, uh, according to mechanism of injury and as you can see from these two graphs on the left you've got just mechanism of injury um, by age and on the right those with traumatic brain injury the dark blue bars define those due to road traffic collision the amber bars are those due to falls under two meters the light blue bars are falls due to more than two meters Assault is shown in red and non-accidental injury is shown in green and as you can see that this majority of this is under two years of age. So the summary of this 10-year um, review um, is shown here but I just want to bring your attention to this comment. They comment that 25% to a third of severely injured children are not taken to the hospital by ambulance and that means that parents and carers are taking these severely injured children to the nearest hospital in their own vehicles, etc. And this has significant relevance to us. And as I've previously mentioned, this article did not mention anything about paediatric major hemorrhage and blood component usage. So I've said pre previously that traumatic brain injury is one of the leading causes of death in children. And why that might that be? Well, paediatric anatomy is different from adults. Children under the age of eight tend to have disproportionately large heads compared to the body. And head trauma is commonly pre present after blunt injury. Some of this is due to the scars of infants, infants having open sutures with larger subarachnoid space and increased extracellular space and therefore they tolerate an expanding intracranial hematoma. Their craniums are thinner so less protective and so even mild forces may result in skull fractures and or significant parenchymal injury. They also have other uh, differences in their anatomy. Their airway is different in several features making airway management challenging. Their um, they have compliant chest walls, more mobile mediastinal structures, liver and spleen in infants and toddlers are less protected by the rib cage and so more prone to direct injury. Um, vascular access is more difficult in children, so fluid resuscitation is often more difficult than in adults. Physiology in children is also different. They have normal vital signs with, which change with age. Generally, the heart and respiratory rates are higher than that's seen in adults and the blood pressure is lower. Children are more prone to hypothermia and insensible blood uh, fluid losses. And hypothermia may worsen metabolic acidosis and cause a negative inotrophic effect on the heart. They have increased physiological reserve, which allows them to maintain their blood pressures despite loss of 30 to 45% of total blood volume.
And so hypotension with uncompensated shock is a late and sudden finding and that requires an immediate response. Pediatric hemostasis is incompletely developed at birth and it, during the, that first six to 12 months of life, the clotting factors achieve, uh, reach the therapeutic levels. So this next slide talks about the major trauma centres. In England, there are 27 major trauma centres, 11 of which treat adults and children, and five just treat children. So the pre-hospital teams have defined algorithms to divert severely injured children to the nearest major trauma centre. As I've said before, a quarter to a third of the cases are not brought by ambulance, but by parents and carers, um, who bring severely into children in their own vehicles to the nearest hospital, which often may be uh, uh, their local DGH. And so this is why it's so important that everyone has major hemorrhage protocols for children. These protocols are based on the concept of damage control resuscitation, which advocates early appropriate component therapy together with minimal crystalloid use directed towards hypertensive resuscitation. The aim is to treat hemorrhagic shock and coagulopathy. This is the first of three cases that I described at the RTC education event. For confidentiality purposes, I won't describe the case here. This is the second case I described at the RTC education event. Again, for confidentiality purposes, I won't describe in detail here. This is the final case that I discuss at the RTC education event. And again, for confidentiality purposes, I won't go into detail here. So I've talked a lot about trauma management, and so I'm going to go through what, what that involves, which, which starts with the primary survey, which is based on identifying and treating life-threatening injuries. This is based on the ABCDE resuscitation system, with C being circulation. And here we recommend that group O, RHD negative, group specific blood is given. And in children, we replace in mils per kilogram rather than in the units that we, we do for adults. And just like adults, we anticipate and treat coagulopathy and low platelets, and we give transexamic acid, and the aim is to avoid hypothermia, hypocalcemia, acidosis, and hyperkalemia, and to get specialist support as soon as possible. BSH guidance recommends immediately given 20 mils per kilogram of red cells with an initial radio of, ratio of red cells to FFP is 2 to 1 but if there's ongoing bleeding this changes to 1 to 1 and this recommendation to use plasma cry and platelets early in an ongoing situation where there's ongoing bleeding. I've listed here the dosage of red cells plasma and cryo and platelets. Secondary survey is doing a physical examination from head to toe with continued post resuscitation monitoring and then using adjuncts, i.e. imaging to identify um, injuries and bleeding points. And if there's any deterioration, a repeat of the primary survey to address any newly identified problems before proceeding to definitive care. And after the initial assessment and resuscitation, definitive management should be by a paediatric trauma surgeon at a paediatric trauma centre whenever possible to ensure the best patient outcomes. So this algorithm is taken from the BSH guidelines. I've had to split it in half to ensure it fits on this presentation. It is exactly like the adults, the main difference being that we give in mils per kilogram in children rather than units. This is an example of, a, of the um, paediatric major hemorrhage protocol we have at Imperial. 
St Mary's is a major trauma centre that treats both adults and children. On the left hand side, the dosage is taken specifically from the BSH guidelines and we aim to give 20 mils per kilogram of O negative red cells and 20 mils per kilogram of FFP until we know what group the patient is. In St Mary's, my paediatric colleagues um, see between two to four major hemorrhages in, in the trauma setting and they contacted me to say that they had too few, a few of these um, protocols been activated to actually do any active training with their juniors. But their general impression was that they were over transfusion. And so they came up with an algorithm which guided them and their juniors in the scenario of what to do when they meet a, a major hemorrhage in children. And on the right hand side is the flow diagram, which basically they're given 10 mils per kilogram boluses, reassessing and given up to the maximum recommended in the BSH guidance. They've put down in the side here um, the targets, which is just like in adults, you're aiming for a hemoglobin above 80, an INR, a PT and an APTT within 1.5 times normal range and a platelet above um, uh, 100. I've also written here when to check the electrolytes and how much to replace in the form of calcium or uh, um, etc. So this next slide I'm going to give you some uh, data that I, I collected from our trauma um, cases in, in, presenting at Imperial. I looked at a six months period in 2018 between April and September and I just wanted to look at what blood component usage these cases had because the TARN data as I've shown you before gives you things like mechanism of injury, age, um, outcomes, length of stay but it doesn't give us anything about blood component usage. So I used um, the trauma numbering system to identify the patients and looked at the paper-based records provided by London Ambulance Service and the electronic CERNA records to uh, identify these patients and identify um, the blood component usage by looking at our telepath, which is our limbs. So these are the results. In that six month period, there were 34 cases 19 of those were in children under 16 years of age and two of those 19 met the criteria for massive hemorrhage. The most common mechanism of injury was fall under two meters followed by vehicle injury and five units of red cells, four were O positive had been given and four units of FFP. 15 out of those 34 cases were children aged between 16 and 17 years of age and out of those 15, five met the criteria for massive hemorrhage. The commonest mechanism was vehicle collision followed by stabbing and stabbing was identified as the most common cause for needing blood. Blood component in this older group was 28 units of red cells with 25 being O positive, one being O negative and two being A positive. Nine units of FFP, nine cryoprecipitate and three platelet pools were used. In both age groups, there were six females each and group, neg group O negative red cells was only used for females, so used appropriately. And all the children were alive at 30 days. So what's the role of a hematologist in this scenario? Well, as a hematologist or transfusionist, we must ensure that every hospital has a major hemorrhage for children. We shouldn't wait for someone else to write it. If, you, if your trust doesn't have one, borrow one from a trust that does and adapt it for local practice. Ensure that everyone who uh, has access to this and is trained on this, particularly those people who work in ED. And as a hematologist, it's, we're usually called to help in this scenario as a last resort and it's often an act of desperation and it's to ensure that all appropriate measures have been taken.
And so we're in the ideal set, uh, setting to provide a common sense check away from the bedside to ensure that all the components have been given in the right volumes at the right time. If you're not a haematologist, what's your role? Well, if you're a TP or a lab manager, it really doesn't matter. You should look on your internet and see if you have a major hemorrhage protocol for children. If you don't, please don't hesitate to contact me or contact Great Ormond Street and borrow a, a, a protocol and adapt it to your local hospital. Ensure that your colleagues in ED and, and anaesthetics are trained. And in the event of the activation of a major hemorrhage protocol, we'll be available to offer support to the clinical team to ensure that all the components have been given in the right volumes at the right time. My take home message is, let's all make sure that all children get the same standard of care when it comes to resuscitation with blood components.